We explore x-rays, computed tomography, or CT, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, nuclear medicine positron emission tomography, or PET, and ultrasound. Diagnosing and treating with radiology tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening, and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. It can sound like science fiction, all the electromagnetic rays, the alphabet soup of names, etc., etc., but these tests and treatments can help a variety of ailments. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. As an interventional radiologist, is that person uh, one? Uh, making diagnosing of illnesses, number two, treating illnesses, or number three, both. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays originally written for this show eons ago comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in, but all night we will answer your questions about diagnosis and treatment with radiology as they're called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight are Dr. Joshua Plord of Avera Medical Group Radiology, Sioux Falls, and Dr. Jay Patel, also of the Avera Medical Group Radiology in Sioux Falls. Welcome, gentlemen. I wanted to say one thing to the audience, one more, uh, one th comment. This portends to be a very interesting show. We're going to show cases where you're going to be there in the in the operating suite. Uh, this is going to be making you understand, helping you understand that this is a whole field that not even the physicians in, in our country realize is going on. So this is really good stuff. Please stay tuned and give us your questions. Well, uh, we're going to tell us a little bit about your definition of what interventional radiology, not diagnostic radiology, but interventional radiology is. Jay, I'll start with you. Sure. So interventional radiology to me is being able to intervene and treat diseases using minimally invasive techniques, however using radiology as a navigational tool. So making that liver biopsy like I used to do, but being able to tell where the heck I was with that needle. <laughs> right. And, uh, and it just makes it all better and more safe. Would you define it further, Josh? I, I think that's a fair definition. It's, uh, Jay and I both probably feel ourselves to be radiologists first, and we went on for additional training to use that radiology to do procedures. So they're image-guided procedures, a whole variety of image-guided procedures. You know, and so uh, before we do anything more, uh, uh, just a little bit more, where are you from originally, Jay? I'm from the Chicagoland area. I did all my training in Chicago. Okay. And where are you from, Josh? I grew up in Seattle, Washington. So, and what drew you to South Dakota? Well, the job, I suppose, huh? Job was a big part of it. I, I left Seattle and did training in um, Rochester, Minnesota, and then I, I married a Midwesterner, and then that's over <laughs> as far as relocation goes, and so all of a sudden where I was going to live and practice became the Midwest. Um, and so thereafter, and I how went. lucky you are, I would yes, say. Yes, yes. <laughs> Jay, it was really the job. Um, when I left fellowship, I was interviewing across the country for uh, a job, and I stumbled on um, Dr. Plord and uh, another partner at the time, and really fell in love with the practice. I felt that they were doing sophisticated work, and the town was very pleasant. It seemed like patients were very gracious, and uh, it was really, really a neat place. I, I'm with you, and I came back from Atlanta. They said, stay, be a teacher here. You know, the teacher world is a kind of an easier world than practicing, uh, but I felt like I was 
being a little hypocritical uh, teaching people how to practice medicine when I had never been out practicing medicine. So I came back to South Dakota. My home is originally de Smet, so I'm pretty close to home. Close, hang in with my family, bring in, with my, bring in a lovely wife all the way from Florida, poor lady, and we've <laughs> had our family here and it's been a great time. Let's just start in on a case. And this first case is yours, Jay. It's the lower abdominal angiogram video, 62-year-old man, disabling claudication and breast pain, opening up with left, uh, with left ventricle, that's not it? Uh, rest pain and the oh, left, rest pain, not left rest. iliac artery, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about it. What do we have here? This is, it's, the video is up, but we're not seeing it on our plate here yet. But what do you see up there, Jay? Uh, this looks like maybe the second case. So this is um, a CAT scan of the lung, and the image on the left shows a nodule, um, and the image on the right that's being zoomed in on shows that white dot in the right um, side of the screen is a renal cell metastatic focus, so it's a tumor. And you can see a needle coming from the top of the screen, that white line going down, and that dot in the middle of the bright um, lesion is a microwave ablation probe. And what that ablation probe does is heats up to a very high uh, temperature and essentially chars the tumor and creates a, what we call an ablation. So we're able to treat um, small cancers without open surgery and uh, without doing a wedge resection of the lung. Now that was a kidney cancer you said. Correct, that had spread, to, spread to the lung, yeah. correct. All right. And I think there might be a follow-up. Uh, the follow-up scan looks like maybe it's on the on the left there, or we're showing it now. Well, that's that's the tumor. Um, there may be a follow-up scan that shows that that area will essentially just become a scar and um, has been has been well treated. Okay. Let, let's go to the next case. Uh, that one is uh, uh, life-threatening penetrating trauma number six. Uh, Josh, this is yours, uh, 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 the uh, Penetrating Trauma picture series. Okay, so, still pictures. So these are a uh, still image. Um, there's some former images. I don't know if we can get them in order. Um, but in, in any respect, this is a picture of an abdominal aorta, um, which has been injured by a penetrating trauma. And what you're seeing, uh, you see a, a column of black in the central portion of the screen and then uh, vessels to each of the legs. So we're generally about the level of the belly button in this patient um, who had received the trauma. And the black material is material in a vessel and it should stay within the vessels. Uh, the, the large black structure that you see to the, leak. To the right of the screen is that oh, wow. it's a big leak. Was it a knife? Yes. So it was a knife trauma, a yes. Saturday night uh, right. fight. To so the aorta. To the to aorta. The aorta. Um, and actually this patient, there's a former image that shows it, but this patient came from the operating room. A surgeon had put a clamp on the abdominal aorta. He couldn't control the bleed and said, we're coming down to angio, please fix this. Um, <laughs> so and so. He, he, uh, he, he's clamped the aorta and left it in your hands. Wow. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so that was the initial image. There's some um, later ones after we, we fixed this problem. Um, we identified explicitly where the problem was, so the surgeon was not particularly aware where the problem was. Um, and then after we had some time to, to fix this, um, this is where the, the leak was there. Um, we've put a stent graft, so it is a piece of metal um, which also has a fabric component to it um, over the hole, essentially. It's like you had a hole in the bottom of your boat and we put some material on that. Um, and now this angiogram is after we're done and the leak is gone. Um, and the man lived. And the man lived. Yep. And I presumed it was a man, but it didn't have to be a man. That's, that's right. So let's go to uh, case number three. Jay, this is your case. Uh, maybe this is... That might be. It might be uh, number two. 
ever. Sure. Yeah. Let's see what case that one is. Oh, so I think we did this one, but um, this is that renal cell. We did cell. this one. Yep, the yep. renal cell tumor that was there. So let's go to let's so go to a different case. Yep. Let's do that for you. Oh shit, did I? No. Excuse me. Yep. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this uh, image shows the lower abdominal aorta. And the column of black, similar to Dr. Plord's case, is the contrast within it. This lumpy, bumpy stuff on the outside shows the atherosclerotic disease within the aorta. So this patient has significant disease of their aorta. And this aorta should feed both of the legs um, with arteries called the common iliac arteries that should run down. We can see on that top one that there is a cutoff where no flow is really getting down the left leg. So this the, the left leg is without blood flow, and then there's all this atherosclerosis in correct. the aorta. So did you, one of those plaques flip and plug it, or maybe? Well, this was a gradual process. The body does a neat thing. All these little vessels that are here are cross-filling from the right side to the left side to give wow. some blood flow to the left leg. That's collaterals. The, collaterals, correct. But this patient had rest pain and disabling claudication to the point that they can't, couldn't walk. So what we've done here is these access points are wires that we've entered through each groin, through each femoral artery, and over here we are trying to cross the area of blockage, the severe plaque that's essentially become a dead end and a rock. We're cutting through with a wire to try to get into the aorta um, with a wire. Here we've done so and we've gotten the catheter all the way through the blockage on both sides from each right and left leg and we're doing another angiogram that shows that the flow is still diminished at this point. Um, now we've used a balloon to try to stretch open that diseased aorta. And we've placed a stent graft, similar to Dr. Plord's case here with a large balloon there uh, with a stent graft, a metal um, cage, so to speak, with fabric on the outside that helps expand this lower aorta. We can see here that there's still no flow going through this left iliac which supplies the leg and after we put another stent graft in each of the common iliac arteries um, this is a balloon essentially with contrast in it so that's not necessarily the vessel but here is the final run that we can see nice flow going through each of the legs without all the collaterals that we had seen previously. Well the collaterals disappeared because they weren't needed. They're going through what we call inline flow so they're going down one channel which is always better than multiple oh, small yeah. channels. So now, is it, was this a very elderly person? Um, you know, generally they're not that very elderly. elderly, but oftentimes they have comorbidities like diabetes, um, or they have a severe smoking history. You know, the smoking is a lot harder on the arteries than anybody really knows. Well, you guys know when you look at them all the time, and the cardiovascular people talk about smoking. I mean, it's always on the top of their list. Right. Why do you think that is? Why smoking causes? Yeah, I mean, anoxia or low grade? I think there's a whole host of factors that help promote atherosclerotic disease and uh, um, your coagulation cholesterol pro profile is affected by it as well. All right. Well, that was, uh, that's, that's great. That was number three. Number four, therapeutic uh, treatment of hepatitis C. Uh, jo uh, Josh, that's yours. Sure. So here we have a CT scan, and uh, you can see these areas right there, which are um, tumors that are present in a liver. So this is a patient who has had um, hepatitis C and has developed uh, primary liver cancer, or what we call hepatocellular carcinoma. Can we stop it for just a minute? Sure. Uh, I don't know. I think we can. So the, qu the, the point I want to make is... Hep, uh, hepatitis C causes cirrhosis. Uh, oh, excessive ink, drinking also causes cirrhosis. Correct. Being obese can also cause cirrhosis. It's, it's, it's just scarring down of the liver. The problem is that cirrhosis can cause liver cancer. And Correct. that's what's happened with this man or woman who had hepatitis C and then ended up with cirrhosis now, can, can you see the cirrhosis on the, on the liver? We could. If we went back to those images, I could show you. So the, the liver edge gets irregular, 
Um, and you can see changes of the liver. Okay. Yes. So here, uh, this is an angiogram, and you can see these two structures here and here. Those are the, the angiographic equivalent to those two tumors, those two balls. Yeah. Um, and those are tumors that are taking up contrast because the tumors in the liver tend to be hypervascular or they're avid for the contrast. They're taking more blood flow than the rest of the liver. Exactly. And that's an avenue that we can then put in chemotherapy. Um, the tumors will preferentially suck up the chemotherapy and we can also add um, small material or particulate material in the chemotherapy that will tend to block those small vessels. So we do what's called a chemoembolization. Oh, I mean, you're going to inject chemotherapeutic, chemotherapeutic agent. agent into it. Into those vessels. And with that chemotherapeutic agent, we're also going to put some embolic material, which is clotting. It'll Cor cause a clot. Correct. It, in a, on the microvascular level. So we tend to try to divorce the tumor from blood supply and give it chemotherapy simultaneously. And what you tend to do is to get a reduction in size of the tumor. This is an image here after that has been delivered. And so you see that the vessel that was once supplying that ball um, sort of dies into nothing. Um, so we've divorced the flow to that tumor, and we'll have some images uh, thereafter. Um, this is a CT scan done the following day, and the contrast that we had given during the procedure um, is still retained within the tumors, and it shows that we had adequate delivery of the material to those tumors. Um, this is our way of seeing that we treated what we wanted to treat. Now, is this the next day or is this two years later? That was the, the very next day. Okay. Now we have some imaging um, thereafter um, which will show um, reduction in size of these. And this is the one, uh, one day, two days later? I think that um, I'm trying to determine whether these are, I have a feeling that these are after the study, maybe uh, two three. Years later. Yeah. three to six months thereafter. Uh -huh. And what we're showing here is that, that these, these lesions haven't grown any, um, and primarily the, the abnormal or the white that we see is, is here in there is the, the medicine that we had given initially. It's still retained in there. We oh. sort of okay. sock that in. Um, so What's the success of, of treating a, a, a liver cancer like this? I mean, is it a temporary thing or is it a... So, it's an excellent question. So, so technically, treating hepatocellular carcinoma, um, doing this is not a definitive or treatment for cure. So there are certain patients that you do this and you slow the tumor down. There's some patients that um, that's long enough for them. There's other patients who are interested in being very aggressive and the only present treatment for cure for hepatocellular carcinoma is a liver transplant. So there are many patients that we're doing this on, they can hold on the transplant list and you can get them to mature to oh, a liver transplant. I see. So we work closely with the, the transplant surgeons and helping them with the patients who may be considered for that. Um, there's some other patients who don't wish to have a transplant and you can slow down their tumors for years and this type of treatment can be done more than once. Um, so you may then see interval growth and you may go back and do the same thing again. Wow. Well, okay, that was the hepatitis C. Let's go to number one, deep vein, vein thrombosis. I think that that's a case of a young woman in pregnancy. Okay. So this is an image. This is the, the hip is right here. So the hip joint, just orienting ourselves, is right there. Um, and we're doing a venogram, which is putting contrast into a vein in the leg. And you see at about this point, um, it stops. There's not much that goes up. So the patient's head would be to the top of the screen, their feet would be to the bottom of the screen, and there's not much blood that's going into the pelvis. These yeah. are some... This is related to being pregnant. I mean, high risk, deep venous thrombosis cases, because you're, when you're pregnant, you get hypercoagulable. Correct, so this patient also was pregnant, as you mentioned. Um, so we also have some risk in doing this procedure and, and having an adverse outcome to the 
the pregnancy, um, which is relatively low risk. But we were essentially able to use a uh, device that helps to break up clot and or suck it out. Um, and so these images here show that area that no longer had flow um, now has flow. Um, at this point, we see that the blood vessel is draining into the IVC, which is the vessel at the um, inferior vena cava. Right. Um, so we now have flow in the leg again, but you can see it's a little rough and irregular. Um, so we placed a catheter into the patient, uh, gave them some medication that helps to dissolve clot, and then brought her back later in the day after that medicine had some time to work. And we have some images um, subsequent. This is showing the catheter that was laid in. So now we have uh, flow through this vessel. Um, so this is working well. And what we're left with is a narrowing right there uh, where this vessel connects to the IVC or the inferior vena cava in the pelvis. This is, that narrowing is created by some pressure between the overlying artery and the spine behind it. And so that narrowing resulted in the flow in the leg being diminished. Could it be the baby pushing on that? It, it could be as well. Maybe um, the baby's going. <laughs> <laughs> no. So it, it, is, it is plausible yeah. you increase the pressure in the pelvis. Um, and so we needed to make that narrowing go away. So yeah. we used a balloon that was shown on a previous image, and then we placed a stent in here. And so we've taken that narrowing that was formerly there away. Um, and then this patient's symptoms of the swollen leg um, was better that day. Not entirely, but improved. And then thereafter, in the next couple of Just days, her, her leg pressure went down. Well, uh, all of the... A terrible uh, fullness and swelling and right. uh, uh, reduces. That's that's wonderful. And her her pregnancy was okay, so she delivered and oh, normal baby. You know that that it went well. Yes. Hallelujah. You know through the goalposts. Yes. Okay. Well, in the last case is some character I happen to know. Well, it's me, <laughs> and so this is a 70-year-old physician and uh, wannabe uh, newscaster. Uh, who had fluid on the liver, an abscess, obviously. And so there's a, uh, there is a question of what do you do? All right, so let's take a look. So Dr. Patel, you wanna describe this one? Sure. Yeah. So this is a CAT scan of the liver. This dark um, structure with a line across it is an abscess. There's a fluid layering um, within this cavity and a liver abscess can be quite dangerous. In other uh, words, if you don't drain it, you die, you, period. The mortality rate would be very high, especially without antibiotics. Um, here, this, this white tube that you see in there, um, structure that's coursing in there, is a drain that we placed um, using CAT scan as our guide, and you'll see a needle traverse the liver here and enter into that space. You may also see a wire that coils in there. It's a technique that we use in, uh, in across all interventional or endovascular techniques to decrease the risk profile. And through that wire, over that wire, we're able to advance a larger drain that will enter through the skin and um, terminate within that collection to be able to aspirate all the, uh, the contrast out. Um, we can see that drain. I've injected, I think, a little bit of contrast to outline the, the residual cavity or the size because um, we tend to follow these patients to make sure that that cavity is shrinking and going away. And we can do that with real x-ray by seeing the contrast pool shrink in time. And I think, Dr. Patel, if I'm uh, right about this, we and you or myself initially treated Dr. Holm, and then um, we had that abscess decrease in size, drain was removed, and then at some period of time, you can tell us better, several months transpired, and then he began having symptoms again. Yeah. And we essentially repeated the process um, to drain the fluid again. Yeah, this time I'm on my belly. So the, the whole picture of a CAT scan is interesting. It's from below. 
So you're looking at the liver from below. That's why you can, on this picture, you see the liver, what looks like it's on the left, which is my right, but it's, it looks like it's the left because you're down below looking up with the CAT scan. Sure. And the, the uh, drain was left in until you guys were satisfied that it looked like it was shrinking and everything was fine and they kept me on antibiotics the first time for three weeks or something and that was it. The second time, I'm still on it. I'm, uh, and it's, you know, since March, April. Sure. So um, that, that was, to me, a great success story. We didn't have a recurrence this time and it was a real mean, hard to treat bug is what it, what it was. Well, I, I didn't realize fully, you know, until my own experience with you guys, how, um, how important interventional radiology is, how, how it, is a, it is an active, uh, functioning, uh, doing the things under radiologic uh, guidance uh, and, and accomplishing so many different things. I mean, we just saw today uh, a killing of a tumor from a kidney met uh, the uh, uh, opening of an uh, artery that was blocked by atherosclerosis, a vein clot in a pregnant lady that was removed, um, and uh, even a case of a, you know, it just um, blows me away. Uh, do, pe do you sense that people don't know what you do? Most don't. <laughs> um, so uh, both inside and outside of medicine. Um, <coughs> You know, the, um, so I think people understand what a, have a general understanding of what a radiologist is. Well, maybe they look at ultrasounds or chest x-rays. And yep. um, you mentioned um, interventional radiology and um, yeah, many people sort of go blank. They're not really sh sure. Um, and our job isn't necessarily to, to change that or to necessarily increase awareness. Our, our principal customers, if you will, or the people that pursue us are, in general, um, physicians who have a patient who has a, a complicated problem, um, or a rather straightforward one, and they're, they're familiar with the things that we can do to help that patient. So oftentimes our introduction to a patient is by a referral from another physician. Um, I think increasing the awareness of what we do directly to the public and or physicians is, is useful, um, but most People don't know what we do. What you do, right? <laughs> it's really, it's, I think of it as a little bit sad, but then I think you'd be too busy to be able to take the time that you have, like you took time to help me, both of you explain to me uh, what was going on and, and got me ready for it. Port placement and bone biopsies are important steps in some treatments. Joshua, Please tell us a little about what is going on to happen in this video. And, and so here comes the video and I want you to respond to what, oh, okay, which case? Right, right, so we're gonna present a case of a bone barrel, bone, a port placement and a bone biopsy and then explain to it what's going on. Okay. We're not going to see video. Okay, so okay. so um, maybe I could take off from here. It's it's not uncommon that patients may come to us from an oncologist, and there's some concern about that they may have a hematologic malignancy. So say a leukemia, a lymphoma, a myeloma, these types of entities, and so they may be interested in us doing a biopsy of the bone or the bone marrow where the the blood cells and myeloid cells live. And um, so we can do that bone marrow biopsy, much like some of these other procedures, use CT guidance, place a needle to the bone, take the sample. Um, we also, for oncologic patients, place a lot of ports, which are um, an intravenous device through which a patient can receive chemotherapy. Um, and we've been doing this for many years, and it's very common that a Oncologists may ask us to do both in the, At the in a same time. similar setting. Um, they know that they're going to go on with this, or it's going to be very likely they can come to us. We can do both of them um, the rather quickly time. and yep. get them on their way. Yep. And I have my port, but I didn't need to have a bone marrow biopsy just to add that. 
So let's take a look at this. This is the port and this is its catheter. And I've drawn a little picture here as to the anatomy that we'll use to place it. So this would be the person's breastbone or the sternum, the collarbone here, the ribs, and the vein or the target that we want is a vein that comes from the neck down to the heart. So we'll place a needle into this vein here. We'll place a wire down into the heart. And then we'll make a tunnel underneath the skin from this location in the top of the chest to where that goes in. The wire we put in there through the needle. So there are our wire is headed down towards the heart where we want it to go. So here's a catheter. This silver thing is a tunnel. It's just a piece of metal. I'll put a little turn on it. So that will help us make the draw the catheter through the tissue. So we start from the pocket. And we just push this to where we enter here. Pull it up here. Okay, that's good. Here we've used ultrasound to get the venous access. We're using fluoroscopy to see where our wires and catheters are going and we'll confirm that the position of this is appropriate when we're done. So we, as a specialty, do a variety of things based primarily on image guidance. So that's kind of what defines our specialty. So we're using imaging as our guide for these procedures. Here is our port here. This is where the port would be accessed with a needle. And this is the tunnel portion going underneath the skin to this location, which is the base of the neck to the internal jugular vein. And then from there, it follows the internal jugular vein down in the chest to the heart by a, a large vein called the superior vena cable. To put this into the bone, take this solid portion out, it's kind of a spear, and then we'll drive this in, and we'll pull this out, and there'll be a little plug of bone there. So that we'll get that to our solid detector. This is our little drill driver. So that's what we're gonna do now. These are three consecutive images. This is the portion of the pelvis that I want to enter. And on this image, this very faint line is this small anesthetic needle. I use that just to make sure my orientation is okay. So here is the pelvic bone. This right line is the needle. So we've just popped through the cortex. We'll take a plug where that black line is and where I'm good position so we can pull the patient out again. Sometimes we do this uh, in patients that are um, larger in which the, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to determine where the pelvic bones are just by palpating them. If they're a bigger bear and there's more tissue between the skin and the bone. So now the outer portion of this has been driven into the bone and there'll be a little plug of bone there. So we're gonna pop that out and give it to our, I'm just gonna push that plug out. And that should go in there. And so then she'll confirm for me that she has what she wants. Well, this has been fascinating. I mean, and I hope people realize this is these are real cases. We're talking about real medicine happening in front of us in an operating room. This is your program, and your questions are key to the direction of our discussion. Call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225, or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. Please, this is your program. I'd love to get questions.
And we do have a, a number of questions. Please explain the training required of an interventional radiologist. Now you've just, you've been practicing for? S I've been here in Sioux Falls for seven years, a little over seven years now. Okay. Yeah. And so what kind of training did you need? Of course, four years of college, four years of med school, then what? It's um, since changed, but when I trained, you did a five-year residency. The first year would be a traditional internship um, of you're choosing either surgery, medicine, or a hybrid. Um, and then you would do four years of radiology for a total of five years. Um, to be an interventional radiologist, then you would go on and do a fellowship, typically of one year. Okay. I think the, it's now it's become its own specialty. Interventional radiology is its own residency, and it's the, I think, the newest uh, residency that's been created, um, just maybe one or two years old now, and uh, that can range from anywhere from seven to eight years of total so it's training. So a lot of training. Wow. It is. It is. And uh, any comment about that, Josh? So uh, I think I was a, just like Dr. Patel training in the old school where you became a radiologist first and then you did your interventional radiology training. So my fellowship was a single year, but it was, it was five years of residency and then a sixth year of fellowship. fellowship. So the, the way I uh, tell people about these long periods of training is that somewhere along the line in medical school, you see this as a job. You're getting, uh, you know, when, you're, when you get into your residency, they start paying you. So you have a, you know, not a lot of money payment. Mine was 8000 a year, <laughs> seven and a half, I think, or something. But it's a lot better now, actually. And then you know, just you do your job, and it's like being a silversmith. You know, you you're a silversmith. Uh, you have a mentor. You f you go in and you learn every day from the mentor, uh, and then somewhere along the line, they re release you like a bird, and you fly away to your place where you become a teacher and a mentor of a new student. Uh, and I think that's a great question. Uh, and we had a chance to talk to pre-meds and pre-PA student uh, kids earlier, and you said something about uh, your take on, uh, on uh, what your mom thought when you said that you were going to be in it. What, this, tell me in that story. Well, um, I, my mother had... Um, Wife of had, a physician. Correct. Correct. So when I was, she was pleased that I was interested in going to medical school and then I needed to go through the process to choose a specialty and when I ultimately um, told her that I was going to go into radiology with an interest in doing interventional radiology because I had that interest at that time, she was, she was disappointed and she said, well, you're so good with people and you like to be around people and you're just going to be in a black box and uh, you're not going to have a chance to touch touch people's lives um, and um, I tried the best I could to reassure her that that wouldn't be the case and, and that that was an important thing so we have the privilege to be able to use these skills and we're meeting um, five to fifteen patients a day doing things like we've seen on the screen and the videos um, so we are actively meeting and touching people. Wow. A caller from Wabe asks, what treatment was most radically changed since interventional radiologists have been involved in patient care? I'll start with you, Josh, but I'll have your response, Jay. Um, I think the biggest um, one, a revolution was started by um, a, a radiologist, Seldinger, who um, started the process of uh, a needle into a vessel followed by a wire followed by a catheter and then built upon that was the use of a balloon um, by another radiologist's daughter who used a rigid dilator and then balloons became evident and used and thereafter um, an interventional radiologist named Palmas designed a stent and that's the platform for all interventional cardiology all interventional or catheter based vascular surgery and what we do every day um, so I think cardiology, interventional radiology, vascular surgery, all these technologies were developed by interventional radiologists 30 years ago, 40 years ago, um, and now it's in practice every day um, across the world. 
So I would say this catheter-based work is it's really important. Jay, anything to add? Yeah, specifically that using that technique, if I had to pick one treatment, um, it would probably be abscess drains, what you had done. Oh. Um, the old surgical mantra was the sun didn't set on an abscess. It right. used to kill people. Yeah. Now we don't see anyone die of an abscess. They call us and we... Um, drain it. We drain it right away. Um, even patients that are not surgical candidates, I think historically, they had to undergo an open surgery to do a, a knife show. into the abscess, yeah. cut it open, put some tape in it, and let it drain. I mean, I keep thinking of the perirectal abscesses that I took care of my whole life, which is not something that I love to tell about, except that, boy, did patients love me after right. doing that because their pain was relieved and the problem went away. Draining an abscess is Yeah, huge. and number two would be stopping bleeding. Um, we have gastrointestinal bleeding, bleeds in trauma situations, uh, pulmonary So gastrointestinal, yeah. well, you're thinking ulcer bleeding from the stomach Correct. or from the duodenum. Correct, that can't be controlled. Or we have bleeding from all parts of the body that would be very difficult to control surgically, um, and we're able to do that endovascularly, like a plumber from the inside of a pipe. Knife yeah. wound, for example, like ah, we saw sure. earlier. Right. Oh, wow, that was an interesting case. Well, I, I think about um, when I, I was a uh, junior medical student, uh, we were in, I was at, at Emory Medical School, the, sec, the, the third year of medical school, the first two, two years in South Dakota, the third I had to transfer. They had a lecture on how to treat a bleeding ulcer and basically they would go in and they would cut off half the stomach and they would re and they would shorten the small intestine and they would reconnect it i, I think there was a name bill for roth. it bill roth two or whatever yeah. that was uh, and it was the bread and butter of general surgery they would and of course when somebody came up with a with uh, a treatment for ulcers like you know uh, i'm tagging that when they came up with tagamet, all of a sudden the whole world went, whoa, and that, that there's an infection that's a cause of it, not something else. But we can, when you have to have surgery, you don't necessarily have to have a Bill Roth II. Okay. You can have, you guys go in with a little catheter. Um, that was great. What is the most common procedure you do, Jay? Um, probably a biopsy. Um, that's probably the heart and soul of the hospital is uh, diagnosing the problem. Um, many people, cancer is quite prevalent these days and before you can talk about treatment or prognosis or you any of those things, we tissue. need to know. Yeah. Gotta have tissue. Tissue, 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 yeah. And formerly that was done with a surgical biopsy. Again, open surgery. Now, as you saw, you can do that with a small needle and not even a Band-Aid. We've got a bunch of questions coming rolling All in. All right. Thank you. A caller from Vaga asked, what is the youngest and oldest patient you have worked with? Josh? Um, neonate to over 100. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> That's about as good as you, broad as you can go to. <laughs> the neonate, what was that? Um, central venous access, so little tiny babies who may be sick, they have sepsis, they need an IV. Um, and they and can't get the, it. Or they're preemie. Mm, they're premature. Premie, tiny, tiny vessels, nurses, other physicians are struggling, um, so we may, we may get an IV in for them. What percentage of your patients are completely asleep? What percentage of your patients are under conscious sedation? That's a great question. Um, I would say We've got greater like than one minute, so we've got to really move fast. 99% of every case we do is either with just local anesthesia or conscious sedation. Very rarely do we need um, an anesthesia. anesthesiologist. Right. But I don't remember you guys in the room after I got this stuff. Uh, what do you do for radiation poisoning, Josh? Uh, very uncommon for us to have it. Um, so I, I don't know of any radiation-induced injuries from the work that we've had in the lab. But if you, if you induce a lot of it, we, t we tend to monitor the total dose as we're going and maybe stop the procedure when we've gotten to a certain dose and maybe come back at it at a later time. Okay. Uh, 
an email asks about how many CAT scans can you safely have post AAA repair and how frequently should they be done? Jay? I don't know that there's a total limit on um, the radiation. There are some guidelines. Generally, they're monitored on a yearly basis. Um, so I, I, I don't think that they get serial scanned multiple times a year, generally okay. speaking. So a serial follow-up would be. All right. After the short break, please stay tuned for the important takeaway messages that we'll get from each of our guests as well as the answer to tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. It's a stark statistic. Each year in the United States, more than 34,000 people commit suicide. In 2017, 191 South Dakotans ended their own lives. Suicide and depression, let's talk. Next time, on call with the Prairie Dog. All of us want our family, neighbors, and friends to have the ability to make appropriate decisions about their health care. To do so, they need access to information from reliable sources, like Dr. Holm and his guest physicians. Hello, I'm Stephanie Herseth Sandlin, and I serve on the volunteer board of directors of the Healing Words Foundation, a 501c3 organization established to support the work of the Prairie Docs. With your charitable donation, you can help the foundation continue to offer free and easy access to the entire library of Prairie Doc health education programs. This mission is so very important to rural communities and residents in particular across South Dakota and neighboring states. Please consider a personal or corporate gift. Just go to prairiedoc.org to find more information on how you can help. Thank you. Uh, so, quick question, interventional radiologists place percutaneous feeding tubes and what does that involve? Yes, we do. We do that quite commonly. It's essentially filling the stomach with air, poking it with the needle, using the same cell degenerative technique to convert it to a drain. A, a caller from Webster, where do you see the field of interventional radiology heading in the future, Josh? Just more and bigger. We're doing more and more procedures. Um, that, more and bigger. That were formerly done open or surgically. Um, so percutaneous techniques are translatable to a variety of different things. Quick uh, take home message, what do you want everyone to remember tonight? Um, that uh, we've now given you a glimpse of what an interventional radiologist can do, um, that there's to raise awareness that often there are multiple ways to skin a cat and that there's many <laughs> specialists um, in different areas that can help. Yep. Josh? We're out there to help. We might meet you at midnight with an urgent problem <laughs> or we might meet you Monday morning with a a more mundane one. We're there to try to help clinicians and their patients. Wow. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. As an interventional radiologist, a person would A, diagnose illness, B, treat illness, or C, both? And the answer is C. And that would, uh, it was Barb Rotsalaman from Lake Norden. Barb Rotsalaman. Thank you for answering the question correctly, and we'll get a book in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. For nearly two decades, the Prairie Doc organization has endeavored to enhance health and diminish suffering by providing useful information based on honest science in a respectful and compassionate manner. Health professionals volunteer to answer your questions each week, creating a vast Prairie Doc library of medical information available to you and your family 24 hours a day. Make sure you don't miss a thing. Follow the Prairie Doc on Facebook and YouTube for free and easy access to the entire Prairie Doc Library. The world of radiology began in 1895 when a European physicist, Wilhelm Rankin, noticed fluorescence behind heavy cardboard when a cathode tube was activated nearby. Rankin used his wife's hand to demonstrate for the first time how these unknown rays or x-rays could penetrate the soft tissue of a hand and illustrate the bones that lay within. Rankin generously refused to patent his discovery, which allowed the explosive growth and development of a new industry. 
Unfortunately, the first researchers were unaware of the dangers of too much x-ray exposure and during the early years harm was done even causing death to some experimenters before safeguards were established. Over time, as technology advanced and more x-rays were being utilized in medicine, interpreting the images became a more difficult challenge and the field of radiology developed. Physicians trained in x-ray interpretation helped other physicians make better clinical decisions. I was a first year resident at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta in the fall of 1975 when the hospital purchased one of the earliest computerized tomography or CT scanners. It was called the EMI scanner or EMI named after the British company Electric and Music Industries. They took the financial risk for developing the technology since years earlier EMI had signed with the Beatles as their recording company. Having amassed a fortune from the exponential rise of Beatles popularity, EMI was able to fund the theoretical work of Godfrey Hounsfield. His invention took x-rays of the head from all directions while a computer compiled the results. With a little help from his friends at EMI, Hounsfield's brainchild happened. I was rotating through neurology when the results of the EMI scans started making an impact. We were amazed how they showed tumors, blood clots, and lesions inside the skull. We thought it was going to change everything, and it did. Jump to the present and see how interpretive radiologists have expanded into intervention. Now instead of simply identifying a tumor or abscess with ultrasound, x-ray, CT, or MRI, radiologists under the guidance of an imaging modality can pass a needle into a deep tumor and take a biopsy or drain an abscess or open up a blocked tube and much, much more. Procedures that in the past would have required open abdominal or chest surgery now can be done with minimal trauma, with minimal pain, and with quick recovery. As a patient who has benefited under the expert image-guided hands of an interventional radiologist, I too can sing loud and clear, I get by with a little help from my friends. Well, a big thank you to our guests, Jay and Josh, for volunteering to come to our studio at Jaeger Hall on the campus of South Dakota State University and add their experience and knowledge to our discussion tonight. Once again, this year's South Dakota State Capitol turns purple later this month to honor those who have died, survived, provided care for, or lost loved ones to pancreatic cancer. It's Sunday night, two, three o'clock. It really isn't too early to get your flu shot. It's important not just for you, but to help protect those around you. Well, that does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Urology Specialist, Brown Clinic, 
American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation, and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians. Black Hills Medical Society. Aberdeen District Medical Society. Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society. Sioux Falls District Medical Society. Dakota Bank. Orthopedic Institute. Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee. Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy. And Swiftel Communications.